Good evening. Let's see if these are working. I think they are. Okay. So welcome. Thank you all for coming out tonight. We were just talking about how in the post-COVID era, we are getting used again to coming out and going to talks and going to things. And it's wonderful to see you all here. My name is Justin Stearns. I'm the, the head of the Arab Crossroads Studies Program here at NYU Abu Dhabi. And um, I'd like to start, before we come to the introduction of our speaker this evening, by thanking the NYU Abu Dhabi Institute for their support with the series of talks that they've been running together with the Arab Crossroads Studies Program on the environment in the Middle East. And we kicked up this series off this past fall, just to remind those of you who perhaps made the earlier talks with uh, uh, Nejat Saliba's um, talk, No Choice But to Keep on Creating Futures, The Frontier of Climate Change, and then with Nuket Varlik, Plague Legacies, Rethinking Black Dead Death Narratives. And later in this semester, the final talk in this series of four will be that of Faisal Hussein, who will be talking on the Tigris and Euphrates rivers in the Ottoman period. And taken together, this series on the environment in the Middle East has links to NYU Abu Dhabi's curricular commitment to providing classes focusing on climate change and environmental challenges. And we see this in the context of next year's COP28. And this commitment will also be reflected throughout our curriculum with a number of hopefully 28 classes within our core curriculum. So that is introduction. Tonight, however, we are overjoyed to welcome Professor Sophia Stamatopoulou Robbins to us here in, in Abu Dhabi, and she's going to be speaking on Waste Siege, as you can see, the life of infrastructure in Palestine. Now, Professor Stamatopoulou Robbins holds a BA in Anthropology and Human Rights from Columbia University, a MSc in Forced Migration from the University of Oxford, and her PhD is in Anthropology from Columbia. The book upon which her talk this evening will be ba based has won a number of major book awards, both the MESAs or Middle East Studies Associations, Albert Horani Book Award, the 2020 Choice Award for Outstanding Academic Title, the AAA, that is the American Anthropological Association's Middle East Section Award, the American Ethnological Society's uh, Award, and the Julia Stewart Award as well. And uh, she's rightfully received a great deal of acclaim for it. She is working currently on a number, or I should say two major other book projects, one which I hope we will see uh, coming out in the next year or two, um, Controlled Alienation, Airbnb, and the Future of Home, which is, deals with an ethnography of Airbnb primarily based on Athens, Greece, and a second, um, Atomic No More, Chernobyl's Mediterranean Afterlives, which deals with the way in which both the a environmental disaster which in some ways has been both remembered symbolically but health-wise forgotten can be, can be traced. And aside from these two, these major book projects, he has published in, in a large number of journals that I, I won't go through here because I want to get us to the talk and because I am so very happy to have her with us here in Abu Dhabi. So thank you so much for coming. In following her talk, we'll have a brief uh, Q&A before we adjourn outside to a, a small reception. So thank you all for being here. Well, um, thank you all for being here. Um, I want to thank Maurice Pomerantz and the Institute for the kind invitation, and Justin Stearns for the very generous uh, introduction. So today, as you heard, I'll be speaking about waste management in the absence of a state. This talk draws on my book, my first book, Waste Siege, The Life of Infrastructure in Palestine, which was published in 2019 with Stanford University Press. And I'm really looking forward to the discussion after the talk. Um, in addition to speaking about my first research project in Palestine, my hope is to offer an overview of how I seek to answer two main questions in my work. The questions are, how do destructive conditions, be they ecological, political, or economic, remake socialities and relations? And how do people harness the material and semiotic properties of infrastructures to make their everyday lives workable, that is, livable, under conditions of duress? I begin with the premise that Palestinians in the Israeli-occupied West Bank are surrounded by what for Palestinian society are unprecedented types and volumes of waste that are also inescapable. I call this condition a waste siege, and I argue that this emergent yet overlooked siege shapes politics and ethics in Palestine in unexpected ways. 
unwanted things are increasingly important actors mediating and complicating life at multiple scales. I conducted fieldwork between 2007 and 2017 with a continuous two and a half year stay between 2009 and 2012. My book posits waste as destructive on the one hand, but also as generative and contingent on the other hand. This means that even in a place where life is dominated by settler colonial militarism and neoliberal statecraft, domination and experiences of it are both mediated by historically specific forms and ways of managing refuse. The book demonstrates that the circularity of waste siege and why I think siege is an apt term for how waste works in Palestine. It also shows how infrastructures and what I call infrastructural forms help us understand how waste siege becomes a part of ordinary life. The three very different examples on which I draw today are the Palestinian Authority's first West Bank sanitary landfill, dumping in the village of Shukba, and bread that is abandoned out of doors. Together, these examples show how waste besieges different people differently and at different scales. Before going on, I'd like to provide some historical context. Palestine's waste siege resulted from a historical conjuncture in the past two, two and a half decades. When Israel occupied the West Bank in, 2000, in, sorry, in 1967, as this audience is quite familiar, it took over Palestinians' health care, education, infrastructures, and the economy. In the mid-1990s, Israel signed an agreement in Oslo with the Palestine Liberation Organization that, among other things, created the Palestinian Authority, which I'll be referring to today as the PA. Israel maintained full military control over the territory, while the PA became responsible for Palestinian civilian life, including waste management on fragments of it. As we see in this map, these fragments amount to roughly 30% of the West Bank, and are non-contiguous. The PA has never been able to create adequate distance between the roughly 3 million West Bank Palestinians and wastes, be that Palestinians' own wastes or Israeli-produced wastes. So part one is called circularity. How do wastes become destructive in Palestine? The phrase waste siege conveys a sense of surroundedness, a sense of life without wastes is inconceivable. My formulation complicates the definition of waste as matter out of place, as some have defi defined it following anthropologist Mary Douglas's famous definition of dirt. For Palestinians, waste is not so much matter out of place as matter with no place to go. It remains present even when it changes form or location. Picture a piece of used toilet paper in a windowless prison cell. You can crumple it, step on it, rip it apart, move, or even eat it, but you cannot in a meaningful sense get rid of it. In this photograph, we see a woman who, in trying to rid herself of her household garbage, must encounter the toxic fumes produced by other people's garbage, which is on fire. The same features that make waste siege destructive also make it generative. Its inescapability, in particular, gives, it, gives waste its generative powers. Any attempt to address the ethical, political, or practical dilemmas that waste creates, or equally to capitalize on the opportunities it opens up, results in the redistribution and reformulation of waste's dilemmas rather than in their eradication. The PA's first West Bank sanitary landfill demonstrates how waste in Palestine besieges even in what we might think of as the ideal scenario when an infrastructure is successfully erected to dispose of it en masse. Under encouragement from its international donors on whom most of its budget depends, the PA opened the landfill in 2007. In many ways, Zahrat al finjan looks like a typical landfill. It is a crater cut into a piece of agricultural land south of Janin, where it occupies an area of roughly 44 and a half acres. But unlike many other contexts where landfills are uncharismatic infrastructures, even for those who manage them, 
In Palestine, they carry a surprising, if dirty and contested, sheen. The Oslo negotiations had implied that the PA would eventually turn into a Palestinian state, but only if it could demonstrate the ready, its readiness for statehood to the international community, including Israel. Readiness, I learned, includes evidence that the PA will protect the environment which the Accords framed as an environment that was shared between Israel and the PA. This sharedness of the environment became justification for the continued Israeli, for continued Israeli involvement in Palestinian waste management and generated an imperative for Palestinians to construct specific sanitary infrastructures. The need to manage garbage was that much greater because of Palestinians' participation in a capitalist market economy. In the mid-1990s, the PLO had also signed an agreement called the Paris Protocol in an attempt to mimic sovereign statehood through consumption. It allowed Palestinian businesses to import goods for the first time since 1967. Since Palestinians lacked, still lacked the financial resources, businesses turned to importing goods that were as cheap as possible. Disposal, disposable and low quality goods flooded Palestinian markets, and then they showed up in the trash. There was now that much more trash, especially the non-biodegradable kind. Since its establishment, the PA has sought to use landfill landfills to replace long-standing garbage management systems comprised of hundreds of smaller dump sites that were unlined and burned. Zahra del Finjan centralized waste disposal by forcing over 85 municipalities to close local dump sites and to haul wastes to the landfill instead. In doing so, the PA made municipal waste its de facto property, rendering waste public at a national scale, and the PA itself all the more state-like for serving as custodian of the nation's wastes. Zahrat al finjans promise was evident, among other, among other things, in the everyday affects and activities of its managers. Promoting landfills for Palestine, which they did, among other things, through social media, like the landfills Facebook page uh, in this image, was what Hamdi and Mu'attasim referred to as national, watani, work. Zahrat al finjan was a historic opportunity to transform Palestine's environment, to create signs of modern statehood, and to work on Palestine at the albeit much reduced national scale. Zahrat al finjan was a way for PA employees to perform what historian Dominique Laporte calls the transformation of shit into gold. Yet in other ways, the landfill was also toxic. It compressed thousands of tons of trash together in one place, creating new environmental risks. Landfills also devour land. They're one of the few infrastructures that grow in size over time. In a film I made with Palestinian videographer Ali al Deek, from which this image is one still, I frame landfills as storage sites for not fully imagined futures. Israel adds new Jewish-only housing in the West Bank nearly every day. That made giving up private, usually agricultural land to store garbage even more anathema to the ethical positions of many engineers like Hamdi and Mottasem, who nevertheless made the decision to do so. Waste burial is also toxic because it is not quite as modern as everyone, in Palestine at least, said it was. The problem is double. One, landfills are being banned elsewhere, including in countries like Germany that were funding new Palestinian landfills. Building an outdated technology helps produce Palestinians as inferior, racialized subjects of colonial rule and as undeserving of the autonomy they are building infrastructures to realize. Two, people like Hamdi and Mottasem viewed other newer technologies, such as heat coupling incinerators, like the one in Sharjah, uh, uh, the project depicted here as more appropriate for Palestine. Incinerators need less land because they transform waste into usable materials and energy. This is significant given Palestinians are forced to purchase electricity from Israel. Finally, landfills are financially toxic. 
operation and debt-based financing for land make landfilling an expensive service. Many municipalities simply could not pay or refuse to do so. But Zahrat al Finjan had been built on a $9 million World Bank loan that had come due. Having closed dozens of municipal dump sites, however, Zahrat al Finjan's operators could not reject municipal trucks that could not pay. Doing so would produce unregulated trash pileups again. And residents already critical of the PA would be watching, as would donors and Israel. So here lies the circularity of waste siege. One way that Zahrat al Finjan's operators improvised to pay back the loan was by increasing the number of people whose waste was disposed of there from 200,000 for which the landfill had initially been designed to 600,000 and then 1 million, hoping that other communities would pay and help pay the non-paying communities costs. But inviting unplanned for waste disposal meant that the landfill's lifespan was abruptly and irreversibly reduced from 30 years down to 15. Israeli prohibition on incineration and donor concerns that Palestinians lack the know-how to manage incinerators means that landfills are Palestinians' only current large-scale waste disposal option. A prematurely full landfill would thus force operators to expand the landfill sooner than expected. To slow the rate at which the landfill was now filling up, operators decided to exclude bulky construction and demolition waste. To temper the landfill's environmental risks and public concerns they raised, they also excluded animal carcasses and medical waste. As I discuss in the book, excluding some wastes from the landfill forced those wastes to accumulate in other locations where they create toxic conditions for the communities now forced to live with them. Here, I want to emphasize that in compressing wastes to mitigate one set of dilemmas, Zahat al Finjan proliferated new waste related dilemmas, enlisting new sets of actors to engage them. And as I depict in the book, all choices in relation to Zahrat al Finjan were ambivalently made. In retrospect, I look back and see that the book could actually be read as an ethnography of ambivalence. These were solutions whose validity remained unsettled. One site experiencing surprising ambivalence is Shukba, a village of about 5,000 people. It is a 40-minute drive from Ramallah and surrounded by Israeli installations and trash mountains. Sadi, the secretary of Shukba's village council, took me through Shukba's valley in 2012. Shukba has been a dump site for at least 20 years for construction, hospital, and factory wastes from nearby Israeli settlements like Nili and Ofarim and from across the Green Line. High tipping fees for industrial and construction waste in Israel have encouraged Israelis to dump illegally in the West Bank, where Israeli environmental laws do not apply. Shukba is also a dump site for Ramallah, for Ramallah area construction and demolition debris and for hospitals sending x-ray images to be burned down for their silver, as none of these wastes are permitted in the PA's formal landfills, as I mentioned. Waste in Shukba is classically siege-like in that it surrounds the village, but it also emanates from within the village. Indeed, uh, outward movement and blockage are two of the things that differentiate military siege from waste siege. Shukba residents have difficulty getting rid of their own wastes because of lacking infrastructures and because Israel polices or obstructs wastes' outward movements. For example, the army periodically confiscates Shukba's only garbage truck. Shukba is further burdened by accumulations of its own buildings after Israel demolishes them, which it does periodically. Donors, for their part, deem villages of Shukba's size too small for wastewater treatment plants. Without such infrastructures, residents have little choice but to send their own excrement flowing into the ground. Dumping occurs in parts of Shukba designated Area C, which you may remember from the map. The two Israeli institutions monitoring Area C's environmental issues are the civil administration, which is the civilian wing of the military, the Israeli military, and the associations for the protection of the environment, 
of Judea and Samaria, which are our two settler organizations. But while these actors evaluate, influence the designs of, and often obstruct construction of Palestinian infrastructure projects, they've done little to alleviate Shukba's waste-related burdens. The fact that Israel has jurisdiction over waste in Shukba will become important in part two when I discuss how waste siege shapes socialities. Here, I wanna highlight that Shukba's waste siege is circular because Shukban's attempts to mitigate accumulations affects redistribute rather than eradicate waste's toxicities. At a physical level, this is the case because when they burn the waste mountains to reduce their size, they release dioxins. Shukbans have high rates of cancer, skin disease, respiratory illness, miscarriage, and impotence. The circularity also reveals itself socially in that years of economic degradation and unemployment have compelled some Shukbans to actually invite dump trucks to their lands for a small fee. I'll return to that in a moment. Suffice it to say here that complicities with siege are central to its circularity. If waste forms an ecology, it is as much a currency with which to manage life as it is a cause of damage. Waste with nowhere to go creates ethical roadblocks as my next example demonstrates. Does it demonstrate? Can I get there? One second. There we go. Um, okay, so one of the most consistent features of Palestinian cityscapes is discarded bread, so much so that I decided to make a film about it. Bread bags hang off of dumpster handles like the one you see in this image, off of rebar and awnings, tree branches, and fire hydrants. We might think of unwanted bread as the gold of the garbage world. But to extend the metaphor, it makes golden handcuffs. Bread is not only a staple food, it is considered sacred across religious and socioeconomic groups. Its status means that bread should not be discarded, even if it becomes stale or moldy. There is broad consensus on the ideal ways to treat excess bread, and highest valued is the use of all bread one procures including by making dishes like the salad called fatouche, which I don't have to explain to this audience, um, and which is the title of my new film. It is common for people to scrutinize each other's bread-related practices as people train themselves and others to make ethical de decisions vis-a-vis -vis bread. Yet people daily find themselves in possession of unwanted bread for a number of reasons that include changes in the modes of the occupation and its economy, urbanization, and what many call the collapse of the National Palestinian Movement, in which I'm happy to discuss further after the talk, thousands of people cannot, deal, cannot meet the ideal standards of excess bread reuse, becoming besieged with it every day. Outdoor bread deposits like the ones in these images are the compromise thousands of people have come up with for managing the dilemma this poses. But, and here is the ambivalence again, hanging bread outside is a solution with concessions. Lina was a university student. She told me that she takes out her household garbage, but she insists that her mother carry out the bag, the bag of bread tied off to place on the dumpster handle. I beg my mother to take out the bread, she told me, giggling uncomfortably. Lena's admission was both funny and serious. It was funny and perhaps embarrassing that she needed her mother's help to take out the trash as a university student. But it was serious in that she was genuinely apprehensive about how to dispose of bread. Because bread is considered sacred, casting it away could make her a sinner, damaging her sense of herself. Many who leave bread out feel torn about it. That is likely why I almost never witnessed anyone actually doing it. It was a compromise executed in furtive, stolen moments. The person who had done it knew she had failed to treat bread ethically, possibly not for the first time, and worried that someone might catch the bread's abandonment. So this is part two um, on infrastructural forms and socialities. So I'll return to the story of bread in a moment. Here I want to emphasize two things. 
One, that inundation by too much of a good thing, in this case, bread, is another feature of waste siege and can be understood as part of its circularity. And two, that casting bread away on public infrastructures was a compromised improvisation that always carried with it the potential to compound the compromise. My point is less that waste should be viewed as something possessing its own agency, which people in anthropology have been worried about for the last uh, decade or so, um, and more that it is infrastructural in that it can facilitate flows, uh, circulations, and distributions of people, goods, and ideas. Waste, then, is an enabler. It creates openings. So I want to turn now to discussing how waste becomes infrastructural and what it helps to generate in Palestine. One byproduct of Zahrat al finjans manager's attempts to deal with the landfill's besieging qualities was what I call landfill time. Inhabiting landfill time meant thinking in terms of a single landfill's lifespan. It borrowed a temporal orientation from landfill's technical properties, for example, that landfills have expiration dates because they fill up. Landfill time anticipates change, but it also creates a suspended for now sensibility. A friend suggested actually that I Photoshop this image because its blueness revealed that it was taken from behind glass. I left the blue in the end. I like how it echoes the way that borrowing landfill time from the landfill layered it with new meanings and functions. Landfill time was an ethical lubricant or salve it both generated and smoothed out incoherences. Thinking of landfill's period of governance as a temporary, but for an uncertain Palestine, long 30-year duration, allowed people like Hamdi and Mu'tasim, who in fundamental way ways were actually opposed to landfills, to square that opposition with the impossibility of managing waste otherwise. It allowed them to suspend judgment enough to see establishing landfills as national work for now, thereby allowing further wastes to be compressed and for circularity to continue. Mr. El Masri, who was Shukba's village council head, told me that he had been writing letters requesting help from various PA offices, including the, the PA police and ministries of health, environment, and local government. Nothing had come of it. The PA failed to respond in part because it lacks jurisdiction in Area C, and because the PA police in Ramallah had needed military, meaning Israeli military, permission and accompaniment to traverse Area C roads, for example, to arrest Shukbans from profiting, who were profiting from the dumping. But what struck me most was that the actors to whom Shukba appealed least, the Israeli army, settlers, and international donors, were those with the greatest ability to help. Of course, you might say, why would you ask your oppressors for help? I assumed this was the logic, but Sadi and others corrected me. Shukba's council had asked for Israeli assistance with other issues like connecting homes to an electric grid and relocating an electric tower. There was something different about waste. It was generative in a different way than other infrastructural substrates like electricity and water were generative. Sadi explained that with waste, there's always someone involved. Waste, especially when its accumulations are intense, disorderly, um, and enduring, contains or embodies questions not only about responsibility, for instance, the way we talk about the responsibility to provide energy or clean water, but also about culpability. For people like Derrida, Levi Strauss, and Rousseau, supplementarity both describes that which is external to an object and supplies that which is missing from it. The external is always already inscribed in that which is then added. I would suggest that people serve as supplements to wastes accumulated as they are in Shukba in the sense that people are external to wastes but are also part of its formation and thus remain attached to it. Water, by contrast, may be produced through human action as people who live here very well know. Um, but as a resource perceived to be natural, water provokes fewer questions about culpability. Water, in some sense, can stand on its own, whereas waste cannot. Shukba's waste siege was thus double. 
It was made of wastes themselves and of muqawileen, the intermediaries who were benefiting from the dumping. It was the social rot of the muqawileen that most perturbed Sadi and his colleagues in the municipality and that tied their hands. With issues of waste, Sadi said, it has to do with the muqawil. He is from the same village. I can, as a son of the village, write a letter against him or a complaint to the PA. That is acceptable, but that I would write a letter of complaint against him to the Israeli authority, then you have betrayal. It was the Muqawalin's role in Shukba's accumulations that precluded asking the military for help. I realized this is likely why, when Sari and Mr. al-Masri had pulled out a stack of complaint letters, or shakawi, Mr. al-Masri had asked for my patience. Sari had blackened some words with a marker as he had photocopied each letter. Once Mr. al-Masri had handed me the papers, I saw that Sari had been concealing Muqawalin names. In my book, I discuss the letter's content and language, especially the council's repeated references to the PA's national duty to help Shukba. I call this an incomplete interpolation. By this, I mean that Shukbans hailed PA officials into shared national belonging, attempting to trigger a, a sense of obligation in the latter. These, interpretation, these interpolations were incomplete, though they failed to produce the desired results. Yet they created opportunities for articulating boundaries and relationships between the PA and local governments, like Shukba, which the PA had created in the 1990s to carry out its vision. Some of my interlocutors called the resulting experience a shibih dawla, or phantom state. Shibih Daula describes Palestinians' experiences of the PA as the governing body to which appeals are made, even where the PA fails to act. It describes the unspoken acknowledgement that Israel remains sovereign but must nevertheless be ignored in waste matters, or certain waste matters. Shukba's waste accumulations were in that sense infrastructural for the phantom state. Outdoor bread deposits are one response to PA efforts to normalize accumulation and obsolescence. They lay the groundwork for alternative political imaginaries by creating openings for indeterminate collaborations between humans, other beings, and things. Infrastructures like awnings and dumpster handles become a place for matter with no place to go, where that matter is both away and not. Outdoor bread deposits also sometimes create unpredictable circulations, both of bread and of shared ways of thinking. In these images, you can see how a family in Gaza smashes bread that has hardened from being exposed to the air outside in order to feed it to their chickens. Even people who said they had never taken cast off bread on the streets said they knew why people did it. That knowing was rooted in a sense of shared ethical orientation toward the sacred object. This is why I think we can say that bread deposits mediate urban public life in Palestine, facilitating flows of people and ideas across space. Left out, bread is endowed with the power to interpolate, even if incompletely here too. It addresses an audience hailing humans and other organisms who want or need it to take it. Cast off bread makes public locations like ledges and walls sites for individuals to perform care for and belonging to an imagined stranger collectivity. One of the most important ideas that this bread practice helps make circulate is that such a collectivity exists at all. This idea is particularly powerful in an extended moment that until the Intifada of Unity began three years ago, many were reading as a period lacking in national level solidarity and vision. Red collectivities resonate with, with, with what anthropologist Anna Singh calls latent commons. For her, latent commons are sites where unpredictable collaborative futures might emerge. They wind through spaces, but do not necessarily linger. As Singh puts it, we rarely notice them, and they are undeveloped, they bubble, with unrealized possibilities. They are elusive. 
My interlocutors did not view casting off bread, writing shakawi, and landfill time as political gestures. They were not gestures consciously aimed at challenging colonial subjecthood. They were ways for what James Phobian calls troubled optimists to live with waste siege that also sometimes rendered responsibility for both waste and military siege indeterminate. Yet these imperfect improvisations should not be mistaken for signs of complacency. Improvisation implies making do, but with an emphasis on making. Social formations organized around specific cultural brokers, collectivities, temporalities, and mediators coalesce when Palestinians improvise to adapt to this emergent form of siege. As existing forms of community are diminished or rearranged, other forms of collectivity may be emergent as supplements. A quick mention of my two next book-length projects may be helpful for showing where I hope these investigations will take me. Both are also in some ways linked to the theme of the speaker series for this year. One is an ethnography of the lingering effects, as you heard in the introduction, of the 1986 Chernobyl explosion uh, in medical practice and energy imaginaries in the Eastern Mediterranean, a project uh, that has suddenly become that much more urgent given the volatile circumstances in which Chernobyl and Ukraine's other nuclear reactors currently find themselves. This project will allow me to more deeply explore the temporalities of the generative and at the same time destructive conditions that interest me. The other project is an ethnography of the politics of sleep in Palestine. It is inspired by black American feminist calls to consider unequal distributions of rest and will explore the infrastructural forms that shape those inequities. So if in my first book I showed how waste becomes both an element of the experience of occupation and an inundating ecology in its own right, in this future project, I hope to consider the relationship between militarization and two other things, the home and rest. I plan to explore how what I call, for now anyway, occupied sleep and the home intersect. I propose or imagine that foregrounding practices and experiences of rest and non-rest allows us to see how the home and body become elements in a broader militarized ecology. That is to say, the home and body become or can become invasive materialities that challenge but also shape the experience of being alive. In closing, I want to scale up and out from Palestine. If waste siege describes the state of stateless Palestine, it's also a metaphor for our besieged planet. It is a matter of proportions and finite space. The proportion of wastes to habitable earth is growing. So waste siege offers a way to think about that and the fact, for example, that radioactive materials are leaking out of nuclear power plants in Japan, New York, and maybe Ukraine and that such leakages, like other waste types that humans produce, including simple things like plastic bags, are outpacing technologies for minimizing their effects. My hope is that this book makes a case for thinking about refuse and excreta, toxic and troublesome as they may sometimes be, as also animating, culturing environments for socialities, ethics, and politics. Thank you so much.